Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the COVID-19 support package webinar for accounting and tax practitioners. My name is Felice Ketenji. I'm a Director of Program Delivery at Service New South Wales, and I'll be your MC for the night. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet this evening. I'm joining you from Tharawell land, and I pay my respects to Elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I'll start with some housekeeping and, um, and then we'll run through an agenda. There'll be some time for uh, covering questions that you've been submitting, um, which you can see on the right hand side of your screen. Thank you. We've received quite a lot of questions already. Um, but to start off, in terms of the agenda, we'll run through some of the, um, the key items that we just want to pay attention to. Um, your questions will be moderated, so we've got a team uh, online at the moment who'll be working through those questions. Um, some of them will be answered in the chat um, and then we'll try and respond to the other answers, uh, the other questions rather, in our Q&A section later on in the session. The session is being recorded and will be posted to the Service New South Wales YouTube channel. Um, I'll commence by introducing Michael Gadiel, Executive Director at Treasury for Economic Strategy. Uh, he'll commence with a presentation now and we'll follow up with um, a, a short presentation by Bridget Barrett, Executive Director, Service New South Wales for Business. And then we'll have our panel um, who I'll introduce separately to go through some of the Q&A. So I'll hand over to you now, Michael, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Felice. Um, so, and thanks for the opportunity, everyone, uh, to uh, speak here today. Uh, these are challenging times uh, for business, but also for individuals. And um, so that's why uh, Service New South Wales and New South Wales Treasury have teamed up to uh, try to deliver to support to business, uh, to those businesses that need it. Uh, we know this has been an evolving and worsening crisis with public health orders first issued on the 26th of June. Um, at that time, we were hopeful that there would be a short lockdown followed by a lifting, and, uh, but we did uh, scramble to set up um, a set of business support programs for that period. But since then, the lockdown has lengthened and the restrictions have intensified. And as that situation has evolved, uh, Treasury has sought to bring new programs to bear um, and Service New South Wales has scrambled to deliver those programs um, across a broad range of businesses. So the purpose of these programs is to support the economy. It's to get cash into businesses. The purpose is to, in to help ensure that businesses can survive the lockdown and also to, to encourage businesses to maintain the relationships with their employees so that they can continue or be ready to continue to trade when conditions return to normal. So, quick potted history. The 29th of June, uh, we first announced the small business grants. Uh, they were um, set up, that was also in, in tandem with the tourism and hospitality grants scheme. And um, they were subsequently extended to become small and medium business grants. On the 30th of 13th of July, uh, we, we announced the Job Saver Scheme, and that was set up to fund um, businesses with a turnover of up to $50 million. So the, the smaller business scheme really capped out at a payroll of $10 million. Uh, the, the, the broadened scheme, Job Saver Scheme uh, was to include businesses up to $50 million turnover. Um, and was also combined with some support for the tourism and hospitality industry, and also uh, some extensions to the Commonwealth Disaster Payment Scheme. Finally, the most recent announcement was the expansion to Got Job Saver on the 28th of July, and that extended the Job Saver Scheme eligibility to business with a turnover of up to 250 million a year, um, and increased the maximum payments to 100,000. So, with each of these new announcements, new challenges have emerged. Um, and uh, we know from the JobSaver experience, we had around four versions of JobSaver, of JobKeeper, sorry. Um, and each time the Commonwealth had to iterate 
and refine as edge cases and specific examples of challenges emerged. And this has been the case for our programs also with those three announcements. Each time we've moved to, to get guidelines published and then to iterate those guidelines as special cases have emerged and we've tried to accommodate them. So where we're at today is three streams of, uh, of programs for businesses, or three mainstream schemes. The first is the business grants. Uh, they are set up uh, to, to support businesses who were impacted during the first three weeks of the lockdown. So that's the period from 26th of June through to 17th of July. And they provide three tiered levels of support, a $7,500 grant for businesses with a turnover decline of 30% or more, a $10,500 grant for businesses with a turnover decline of 50% or more, and a, and a, and a grant of $15,000 for businesses who experienced a decline of 70% or, or more. And that program was very much like the programs the state had rolled out in 2020. And so um, it looked and felt a lot like past business grants programs. It was targeted to SME type businesses. From week four of the lockdown, things changed and the Commonwealth had made the decision that it was not going to reinstate JobKeeper. And so we worked with the Commonwealth to set up JobSaver, of which the Commonwealth is now funding 50% of the cost. But unlike JobKeeper, JobSaver is being administered by the state and Service New South Wales has stepped up to deliver that and has um, scrambled to set up a program, um, an enormous program from scratch um, to try and get payments out to businesses. So it was clear to us that with an extended lockdown, it wasn't sufficient to provide flat rate grants, that we would need to provide um, week to week ongoing support to ensure that businesses were able to survive and so we've aligned payments to businesses to 40% of their weekly payroll. Um, the minimum payment is $1,500 a week and the maximum payment now is $100,000 a week. And it's open to businesses with an annual turnover of between $75,000 a year and $250 million a year. Uh, and we'll get to some of the detail on that a bit further along. It is also open to non-employing businesses and those businesses are entitled to a payment of $1,000 a week. And the, the point to note that if a business is non-employing non and there is a, a person associated with that business who is um, deriving income from it, then that income, that, that business or that person has the choice to, to accept uh, the job saver payments or the individual COVID disaster payments, but not both. So if you're not an employee but deriving uh, income from a business, you must either go down the individual pathway, which is the Commonwealth's COVID-19 disaster payments, or you must go down the, the business grant approach, which is in this case, JobSaver. And this division between individuals and businesses becomes even more uh, acute when we move to the third scheme, which is the micro business grants. And that is set up uh, to support businesses, um, much smaller businesses, with a turnover in the range of between $30,000 and $75,000 uh, a year. And for this particular group, we know there are a lot of sole traders. And again, uh, the, the individual, if they are an individual um, who's deriving income from that business, a non-employing business, must make the decision whether or not they go down the COVID-19 disaster payment route or the business grant route. Um, but in this particular case for the micro grants, the payments are aligned. Um, the, the payments are $1,500 a fortnight for the uh, micro grant package, which is uh, equivalent to the most recent update to the COVID-19 disaster payments of $750 a week. So, uh, and that program is again an, a, a program extended out for the duration of the lockdown to the 28th of August. Applicants for these second two payments, if you apply for JobSaver today, uh, you will be backdated payments to the 18th of July. And if you apply for the business micro grants, you'll be backdated payments to the 26th of June. Um, the business grants is a bit different because that was set up only for the first three weeks of the, of the lockdown. Um, and, and so uh, it, it closes a little earlier. Uh, but the but you can still apply for it and you will be paid for the period of 26th of June 
to 17th of July. So that's, uh, sorry, I've, I've got some information down at the bottom on the individual COVID-19 disaster payments. And I include that because uh, when giving advice to businesses who have to make that choice, uh, we need to make the, the comparison as to what someone would receive taking the disaster payment route uh, versus what they might receive under the business um, grant route. So moving on, um, so starting with the business grants. Um, so these are, uh, was, were initially just small business grants, but they've, uh, they now take in uh, medium-sized businesses as well. Um, and so they're for businesses with a, a payroll of up to $10 million a year, um, or a maximum turnover of $50 million a year. Most, almost all businesses that are eligible for this scheme uh, will also be eligible for JobSaver. JobSaver will, will, there are a wider range of businesses that will also be available for JobSaver. So, um, in terms of applying for this um, package, it's worth noting that um, there really are two streams of application. Uh, one is for businesses in highly impacted industries, and these include businesses that we know have been shut down as a result of the orders. So, businesses like personal services, a lot of the tourism and hospitality industries we know are highly impacted, and we also know that a lot of retail is highly impacted. So if you're one of those businesses and you fall into that, your AB, the ABN uh, is, is classified into one of the ANZIC codes aligned with that highly impacted list, then there is a lower uh, documentation requirement um, uh, for the application. So you need to, they'll need to submit evidence of turnover to determine that the business fits within uh, the turnover range. Uh, and they'll also need to, um, so to do that, they'll need to submit an Australian tax return for the 1920 year um, to demonstrate that they fall within that range. Um, and they'll also need to provide details of their tax agent or accountant. Um, if they're not on a highly in impacted list, they'll need to provide a tax return to demonstrate turnover. Uh, but they'll also need a letter from an accountant, uh, a tax agent or a BAS agent to uh, certify or, or attest that there is in fact a 30% decline in revenue. Um, moving now to the job saver scheme. So again, uh, the job saver scheme picks up where the business grant scheme leaves off and it commences from the 18th of July. Um, so for job saver, um, it's, it's, an, it's, it's scheduled to extend out to the end of the period of the lockdown in, on the 28th of August. Um, it's eligible to all businesses and not-for-profits, um, and it's to cover costs, uh, business costs from week four of the lockdown onwards. Qualification is a 30% decline in turnover, and it must occur over a minimum of a two-week period. Um, So in, in demonstrating the turnover, there are three tests. Um, we know that businesses are impacted by seasonal effects. And so, um, so, we're, so we'll they need to compare a two week period during the lockdown with a two week period either in 2020 or in 2019. And over that period, I'm sorry, hang on. Sorry, new puppy. Um, so we need to compare it with um, a period in 2019 or the two week period immediately prior to the lockdown. So for new businesses that weren't operating either in 2019 or 2020, um, they'll need to compare their revenue with, um, they, they can have the, the option of comparing their revenue with the two weeks immediately prior to the shutdown. The one condition on a new business is you must have your ABN registered by the 1st of June. So for this group, um, there are two, again two ca categories. There's the highly impacted businesses. So those businesses that fall into the highly impacted ABN list or ANZIC code list. And for those businesses, they'll need to submit a tax return to demonstrate annual turnover. They'll need to submit either a BAS, uh, business activity statement, or if you're not GST registered, um, but you pay New South Wales payroll tax, then you'll need to submit your New South Wales pay, payroll tax reconciliation form to demonstrate uh, your, your weekly payroll. 
And the reason why we need to demonstrate payroll is obviously to calculate the weekly payments, which are aligned to 40% of your weekly payroll. And in terms of that payroll concept, it is it won't it may not necessarily align with your BAS return because it, it, it should only be for those employees who are based in New South Wales. So if your if your firm is operating across two states or more than one state, then you should be um, you should be reporting payroll for the for those employees that are New South Wales based. You also need to supply uh, details of uh, you're a qualified accountant, tax agent or BAS agent um, for verification of turnover decline, but you're not required to submit um, a letter um, as documentary evidence um, or, or uh, you don't, a, a, an accountant's letter is not required for this group because they're on the highly impacted list. They're assumed to, um, to, to, to have been impacted. The one qualification to that is that if your weekly payments are above $10,000 a week, you will requ be required to submit an accountant's letter. So for non highly impacted businesses, so for the businesses not on that list yet are still suffering a turnover decline, they'll need to submit all of those things. Plus they'll need an, a letter from an accountant attesting to a 30% decline in, in revenue. And it's worth noting that regardless of whether the business is, is on the, the highly impacted list or is not, the business itself needs to satisfy itself that it is uh, suffering a turnover decline of 30%. So it will need the business person or owner will need to do their own calculations to make sure that they can honestly attest uh, to Service New South Wales that they are suffering the turnover decline. So moving on to the micro business grants, this is for much smaller businesses. Um, and we understand given that they're below the $75,000 turnover that they're below the, the regular GST reporting range. Um, and for this group of businesses, um, we're uh, opening up to a wider range of documentary evidence. So again, if you're on the highly impacted list um, or, or not on the highly impacted list, um, you, you, there's quite a broad range of, um, of, of documentary evidence we'll accept. And that includes a letter from an accountant, a business activity statement if you have one, it, a set of annotated bank statements, uh, or a profit and loss statement from an accounting uh, software package. Um, so those are the things uh, that we're looking for um, from a from a micro business grant, but we accept a wider range of, of documentary evidence for this group. Um, so we might move on to the next one. So the, the point, the point, I guess, that I emphasised before for micro business grants is um, the individual, particularly if they're a sole trader, establishing if they would like to go down the micro business route route or down um, the, the uh, business grant route. So for a qualified accountant, uh, sorry, for accountants letters, um, this has got to be uh, from a qualified accountant, registered tax agent or BAS agent. Um, it's also uh, it's, it's got a there's templates up on the Service New South Wales website um, and uh, for, for accounting business itself, it can provide its own letter, but not if it's a sole trading accountant. So a sole trader cannot provide a letter for their own business, but if it's an employing accounting business, uh, then with, with more than one accountant in the firm, then they can provide their own letter. So I'm going to skip over some of the Com Commonwealth disaster payment uh, information because I think it's it's probably less relevant to this group, but it's up there because just to emphasise that uh, it's quite complicated. The New South Wales government is meeting the cost of extending COVID-19 disaster payments outside of Commonwealth declared hotspots, which accounts for a lot of regional New South Wales. Um, so uh, that's being uh, administered by Services Australia, but for those people outside of um, declared hotspots. It's being um, funded by the New South Wales government. So I'll skip over that as well. So just here, the schedule of, of payments. It's worth noting that um, uh, for the rest of New South Wales um, uh, and, and for Sydney, the current payments are around uh, $750 for the loss of um, 20 hours or more and $450 for the loss of 
eight hours or up to eight hours, or sorry, more than eight hours to 20 hours. And, and I think a recent feature of this announcement is the inclusion of um, the, the $200 payment for those already receiving welfare benefits. So my team has worked very closely with stakeholders to try and um, resolve key issues for stakeholders. Um, and among them is, I, I think the key one is the issue of the job saver turnover threshold. So for larger firms, it is the aggregated annual turnover of that firm and it includes foreign affiliate revenue and it aligns with the ATO um, definition of aggregate turnover. Um, so it's closely associated with the JobKeeper annual turnover test um, and there will be updated guidelines published on the Service New South Wales that provide further information on that. Um, but here it is, it's aligned to the, to the Income Tax Assessment Act. The second uh, thing that we've worked hard to resolve is the comparison periods. So previously where a business was unable to um, provide the documents demonstrating a decline in turnover um, for the, because they were a new business or because their business revenue has changed or because the business has been restructured, we now have a simpler streamlined test, which is two weeks during the lockdown um, that relates to that particular grant. So if it's the business grants, it's the first three weeks. If it's job saver, it's week four onwards. Or if it's the micro grant, it's anywhere from the start of the lockdown on the 26th to the end on the 29th of August. Um, so any two weeks in that period with the equivalent two weeks per two week period, either in 2020, or if bushfires and other lockdowns and COVID affected that year, then they can go back to 2019. If the business doesn't have a trading history that long, then it can compare that revenue with the two weeks immediately prior to the lockdown. So I think this is an improvement because it gets up front what the tests are. People don't have to contact Service New South Wales. They can just apply directly using one of those three comparisons of their choice. And finally, the other thing we've managed to do is get um, some extensions out to the COVID-19 disaster payments, particularly those in non-hotspot declared areas and those already receiving um, Commonwealth benefits such as carer payments or partial job seeker payments. So finally, um, if lockdowns are extended, um, we have been knocked around because the, the crisis has evolved and I know that there has been a lack of clarity in terms of policies, guidelines, FAQs. They have changed and we are very conscious of that. Um, and that, that has simply been because the policies have changed, the programs have been changed and they've been changed to accommodate what we know to be the evolving nature of the crisis. Um, so I think we have more or less a stable set of policies at least out until the 28th of August. Um, beyond that, we don't know what's going to happen, but um, if restrictions change for certain industries, we may go back and retest those industries and ask them to reattest that they're continuing to um, experience the decline in turnover that they were um, during the, the first part of the lockdown. And obviously, um, uh, th there's, there's the option to continue those programs in line with any extension to the broader uh, restrictions. I think that's it for me. So I'm going to hand it over to Bridget to talk about Service New South Wales approach. Hi everyone. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm Bridget Barrett, the Executive Director for Service for Business. I really wanted just to say a few words around the delivery of the programs from the service perspective. I know many of you um, on the webinar or many of your clients would have been contacting service um, over a number of weeks now and would have experienced a delay in either a callback from a business concierge or um, getting through on the call centre. I want to apologise for that. Um, as Michael said, we've, we've really scrambled to get these programs up and running. Um, but, you know, what we do recognise is that there's many businesses that are experiencing a lot of pain because of COVID and this delay hasn't helped them. We've actually experienced a 40 hold increase in demand. Uh, sometimes that equates to 20,000 calls a day and about 5,000 
call registrations, callback registrations a day. We have put on hundreds and hundreds of staff in the assessment space, in the contact space and in the BC land to really ramp up our demand and we are striving to get much better responses um, in those areas um, during this week. I thought I would just give you a bit of a sense so of what is actually happening with the grant. So the business grants, uh, there's been um, just over 104,000 applications with about 278 million paid um, or, or approved to be paid from the service site. The micro business grant around 22,000 um, um, applications and 417,000 approved to be paid. And the job saver program, we've had around 67,000 um, applications, and around 86 million uh, approved for payment. So I appreciate there's some, um, you know, there's some questions there around payment. We are doing everything, striving to get those payments out as quickly as possible. And um, as Michael said, our guidelines will be updated on the web and we will endeavour to um, really speed up our response times. So I thank you for your patience and your support with small business as well. And uh, I'll hand you back over to Felice. Thank you, Bridget. We'll go now to our Q&A panel session. Um, I've already introduced Bridget and Michael and you've met them both. I'll introduce our other two panel members. We've got John Quick. Uh, John is a business concierge with Service New South Wales for Business. He's one of the experts that um, you might talk to if you call Service New South Wales and ask for um, expert advice on some of these programs. And um, he's, he's part of a large team of people that are providing that uh, expert advice and support to our businesses across New South Wales. Also joining us is David Allen. David's, David's a manager, um, key customers, business taxes at Revenue New South Wales. And he's one of the people behind the scenes who is working actively to um, help get those applications assessed. So we've got some great experts here that will start to answer some of the questions that you've been posting to us. Um, I note that Michael has answered some of those questions already in his presentation. So if we don't get to every single question, um, please note that some of them will have been answered through the presentations and then we'll try and get to the ones that uh, a lot of you are asking and are frequent questions. And then we'll, when we wrap up, we'll, we'll give you some more details about where you can get additional help for the questions that you've got. So um, we'll start with the, the one of the questions around um, accounting firms and um, how they're being asked for letters from accountants um, for the applications. So I might throw to uh, Michael you on this one if you if you if you don't mind. Um, in particular, the question is around accounting firms that are wishing to apply for the grants and having to find independent practitioners. Now I know you covered this, but you might just want to quickly touch on what we're asking of people there. Yeah, so we're just asking that if you're a sole trader, um, that you go to another accountant to get a letter, that you don't write your own letter. Uh, but if you're an accounting firm with more than one person, it would, so it has employees, then you can write your own letter. So it's just those so sole traders who are being asked to write letters for themselves as individuals that um, they'll need to go to another um, sole trader. And, and if you're worried about a competitor, I guess, go a bit further away. Yeah, thank you. Um, while, while I've got you on the screen, I'll, um, two follow-up questions um, around the disaster payment. Um, so the first one, Michael, is around company directors who might be individually eligible for the disaster payment, um, but their company is receiving a business support grant um, and job saver payment. What advice do we have for them? So if you're a company director and it's a firm set up with employees and um, you're uh, not deriving income from that firm, then um, then whether or not you get a COVID-19 disaster payment is really contingent on whether you've lost hours of work as an individual from whatever you are employed doing. Um, now, if you are um, a company director and you're associated with that firm and um, 
you've lost hours, then you can um, apply for a COVID-19 disaster payment as an individual. But if it's a non-employing firm, you probably can't apply on behalf of that firm if you are receiving income from that firm. So you need to decide whether your firm applies or whether you apply as an individual. If you have employees, um, uh, if you're an employing firm, you can apply. And if you lose hours as an individual or lose time, then you can also apply for a COVID-19 disaster payment. So you can apply for both. So if you're a director and you lose hours, but it's an employing firm, you can apply for both. Thanks, Michael. Um, we'll go now to the comparison period for the small business grant, which recently changed on the website. Um, you did mention that we've provided more uh, reference points for individuals to demonstrate that their business has experienced a decline. Um, I, I, the question is, can they use other periods of comparison? Um, but I think we've, we've covered that one off, so yes. I'll, I'll just respond so, by so I think saying we that. Just stick, yeah. We stick to the three. Um, businesses can choose which of those three, so it's quite flexible. It's two weeks during the lock, relevant period of the lockdown with 2019, 2020, or if the business wasn't around during that time or that doesn't work, then it's the two weeks immediately prior to the lockdown. Thanks, Michael. And that's been updated on the Service New South yeah. Wales website. So um, anyone who's got further questions can have a look at the FAQs and the information about the individual grants for those specific um, periods if they miss that. Okay, so Bridget, next one um, I think is probably a good question for you to answer. It's in relation to the delays to payments to businesses. Um, that, you know, there's obviously a lot of time and effort that goes into businesses and accountants preparing the letters that are submitted along with their applications. And we've got some people that have been waiting a little bit of time, um, some of them up to six weeks for their um, payments to be processed. Yeah. Um, look, um, as I mentioned, um, all of the areas, including the assessment area, have put on um, large volumes of people to um, to move the assessments through. I think some of the changes as well are that Michael has talked about in this um, in this forum will actually help in that space. Um, we are um, working closely, the business concierges, with the assessment team um, to see with it, how things are travelling and answer sort of individual cases on that. Um, but we are definitely uh, trying to move the bulk of our um, our assessments and our callbacks and improve that response time. Thanks, Bridget. Um, Michael, one of our next questions is around the, the use of the funding that's received. Um, so the, the question is around the micro grant, micro business, and does it have to be used to cover business costs? And what if the costs are greater than the value of the grant per fortnight? Um, and does that mean the business isn't eligible? So, so the, we're asking that the, the grant be used to cover costs, the business costs, and um, we expect that over time um, there will be sufficient business costs to expend that grant. Um, now, it, we know that it, it's never going to be enough for everyone, um, but we have to come up with a, a way of doing things, and we've set it at 40% of payroll, uh, which we think um, on average um, works for a lot of businesses. But that's not to say um, businesses can continue to operate as they did previously. Um, we understand that businesses are going to have to cut back and make decisions for themselves as well. Um, but this is the government coming to the table and meeting some of those costs as well. Thanks, Michael. Um, so the next one is we've got tax agents um, and practitioners that are trying to apply on behalf of clients. And um, I, I can state that our applications form do allow um, agents to apply on behalf of their business. Um, I, I think that um, there, there were some issues at the beginning where some of the accountants weren't able to submit their applications, but that was resolved very early on. So we might move on to the next question. Comparative periods 2019, 2020 and the two weeks before lockdown. 
Is this for all businesses or just for new businesses? Um, Michael, did you want to take that one? Yeah, all, all businesses. Thank you. Okay. And I think we've got a couple who have asked similar questions. So um, regarding the decline in turnover comparison period uh, for the last the weeks in June and also in 2020, how can businesses that applied prior to this date, probably in their thousands, amend their applications to be based on the new comparison periods? Um, I might throw to John for this one. John, what would you advise businesses who might need to make a change to their application form? Well, we do have a process around um, voluntary withdrawal. Um, I, I would probably revert that to, to Michael about um, whether that would be acceptable because if they've applied previously and been approved or it's in process, can they then turn around and change that in order to to perhaps um, show a greater decline. Uh, Michael, are you able to answer that, that part of it? So, so I guess uh, f for JobSaver and micro business grants, we're only looking to see a 30% decline. So there's no, um, there's no issue there. Um, you, you either meet the test or you don't. Um, I guess the question then is for the business grant. Um, so that's something we'd have to take on notice and think about. Um, so I'm assuming that if you, over the three weeks, um, you might be able to shift the weeks around and show a larger decline and get a, a larger grant. So that's something that we probably need to take on notice and clarify. Thank you, Michael and John. Um, if a client supplied for the grant um, with a drop in turnover of 30%, but after applying for one of the new alternative testing periods, they, their decline goes to 50%, how do they go about editing their application? So I think this is the same question again, um, and it's worth noting that it only applies to, for, again, for the business grant, um, and there's only three weeks there anyway. So I guess um, to, to me, you, you would have had to have picked one, picked one of the two of the three weeks at least, um, and so it seems to me to be fairly limited um, scope for demonstrating a different decline, but it may be that the decline would appear different um, compared to the other periods in question. And so that's something we need to look at. Thanks, Michael. Okay, so we're looking now at, at um, decline in turnover test and um, the fact that it needs to be due to the COVID lockdown. The question is, how is this proven? Yeah, so or is the evidence that it's 30% decline yeah. is enough? Uh, so no, it needs to be because of COVID, because businesses are seasonal. Um, and some businesses have intermittent income. So, for example, we're in winter now and it's outside of school holidays. And so if you're running um, a, a, an Airbnb business, you, you may just have uh, less revenue now um, than, or, or, than you do ordinarily. Um, or it may be that businesses have a lot of idiosyncratic revenue uh, that comes and goes. And so um, that, that's part of the ordinary course. If that's part of the ordinary course of the business, then that is not a decline due to COVID. Um, it has to be that the, the, there is um, a clear linkage between the decline in revenue and the restrictions in place. Um, and that's really up to the, the accountant who's writing the letter to verify and to satisfy themselves that there is um, an argument there from the business that the, the turnover decline they've experienced is due to the restrictions in place. And perhaps worth adding there, Michael, too, that if you're in a uh, highly impacted industry, um, the, the fact that you're in that industry is evidence that you're impacted by COVID at the moment as well. Is that correct? Well, you are being asked to attest as an individual that you've suffered a 30% decline due to COVID. So even though you're not being asked for a letter from your accountant, you are subject to ex post audit by, by service and revenue. Um, and so you do need to... Um, uh, satisfy yourself that you've experienced that decline in business and that that decline can be attributed to the restrictions in place. Thank you. Um, now on to a question around micro grant and job saver. Um, what if you didn't have many costs during the lockdown? For example, you don't pay rent or you don't need to be paying wages during that time because you've reduced the hours of your employees. 
are you required as a business to refund the excess grant monies? So and I think, sorry, I was going to say, did you want to answer that or do we want to throw to someone else in the panel? No, no I'm happy to answer. I mean, I think it's the same. I think over time you will have expenses that that that, that money can be put towards. Um, so the idea is we, we want to see cash get out to businesses. We want to keep businesses going and um, and we want to see them restart when the restrictions are lifted. And so um, I don't think there's, there's no plans to ask for that money back. That's money that goes to the businesses uh, to use for that business to get it going when um, when things restart. Thanks, Michael. Um, one of our questions is around um, drawing paid to business owners and whether that qualifies as an expense um, for the grants or subsidies and can they apply uh, against that particular expense? So, so wages expenses are an expense that can be claimed um, against the grants, yes. Thank you. Um, next question I might throw to John. Um, we've got an example of a client who's trading as a sole trader, but using their ABN and they changed their entity to a company on the 1st of July with a new ABN. Um, the business itself um, hasn't changed, just the structure. Can they use the sole trader turnover as a comparison? And um, David, feel free to jump in if you've got anything to add here as well. Uh, yes, um, and I think Michael answered this in, in a previous forum where we're not interested in in what you were and what you are now in terms of entity. It's about whether it's a continuation of the business and if you've got the required documentation to, to show that it is the same business, then yes, you can use that, that information. Okay, thank you. Um, Next question is around Service New South Wales advising clients that they can't apply for Job Saver until two weeks after applying for the business grant. Is that correct? Um, Bridget, maybe that's one that you can take. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I would probably have to go back and do a bit of an audit on the website, but I think, you know, if I go back to, you know, Michael's presentation, um, when it was recognised that, you know, this COVID situation was going to go on for a lot longer and the shutdown and what we thought, um, there was a lot of discussions with the Commonwealth and, you know, the state and the Commonwealth uh, worked as quickly as they could to then um, develop up JobSaver and, um, and get that up and um, moving fairly quickly. And really in the space of two weeks, I think there was three grants. So, can't exactly answer how many days it was, um, Philippe, but certainly uh, the response was as quick as we could once we knew things were being extended. Thanks, Bridget. And I think some of the confusion there might be around the fact that um, we, we are looking at designing a condensed uh, customer journey for customers who are eligible for the business grant and who are then also eligible for the job saver grant so that they don't have to answer all of the same questions. Some of that messaging might have been to do with um, a, a more revised um, streamlined form coming soon. Okay, so um, to payroll related question, um, the W1 figure that includes um, IASs as well as a BAS, um, it's simple but critical part of the application. It's not clarified anywhere uh, that's easy to find. So um, which, which um, data point people need to be using to um, provide their average weekly payroll amount? Um, Michael, maybe that's a good question for you or if you want to throw to David, who's looking at um, those amounts, maybe David could answer as well. I, I could give it a, a go. Uh, Thanks, David. So basically, uh, knowing what you put in your bears and whether it's the three monthly or the monthly bears, um, regardless, if I understand the question, regardless of the income assessment state income assessment statement, the IAS, mm -hmm. the, the BAS is, um, for ease of purposes, is you've just got to work out whether it's for the month or for the three months and, and divide it by the number of days and times it by seven to work out the eligible component for the, for the wages. Uh, that's didn't sound that simple, but that's, that's the basic uh, calculation. I agree with so, that, David, except 
Rather than multiply seven, multiply by 14, uh, 14 for the fortnightly or seven for the weekly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, Michael. OK, and um, I think at that point in the application form, we do have some instructions that um, you need to click through to, to see in terms of the different documents that are being used and how to do the calculations. So there's some further information there provided at, at the application form point. OK, so we've got an example now of two affiliated companies. Both have the same director. Company A conducts business activities and has experienced decline in turnover of over 30 percent. And Company B is an employing one that only employs staff that work for Company B. For the Job Saver grant, which company should they apply through? So, so um, the turnover is with one firm. Um, but the turnover decline is with the other, and this was a this was a tricky edge case that emerged with JobKeeper as well. And I know the JobKeeper guidelines were amended, but based on the way that our guidelines are set up now, um, if there is a 30% decline in demand, I'm presuming then that there is also a decline in demand for labour, and so the 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 employing firm would be receiving less money from the um, the, the turnover firm. And so its turnover would decline as the demand, as, as if the business is, is suffering a reduced demand, it would have reduced demand for labour. And so given that the, the job saver payments are linked to payroll, um, i.e. you will want to be applying, uh, the firm that has the employees will want to be applying, then I would suggest that it was the employing firm that should make that application. But presumably the turnover decline um, is experienced by that, that that entity. Um, noting that um, for uh, the turnover test as a whole, both those entities would be grouped together as a single entity. And so it would have to satisfy the below 250 million turnover test to be eligible for JobSaver. But for the purposes of the turnover decline, um, in line with JobKeeper, we, we would use the ungrouped GST uh, turnover. So those two firms would be degrouped for the purposes of um, a turnover decline. So um, ideally you'd want the entity with the employees to make the application and presumably if demand for labor declined then so too with the, with the income of the part of the entity that is employing the staff. Thanks, Michael. Um, David, if you could talk a little bit to partnerships, um, we did get quite a few inquiries around um, partnerships and, and their eligibility. In particular, um, if the business is the primary income source for only one partner, what do we do in that situation? Okay. Uh, well, basically, if a partnership is uh, non-employing, uh, they won't. They'll they'll be able to only apply for uh, using that turnover test. I'm fairly confident. I'm just trying to read the question. It's getting a bit blurry. So it's around non-employing partnership business um, and are they eligible for the grants if the business is the primary income source for only one partner? So, so it's irrelevant yeah. whether it's uh, a business income source for one partner or both. The business is eligible to apply, um, but the partner whose income source it is can't apply for the COVID-19 disaster payment as well. Um, it, the other partner, if it's not, if they're not deriving any income for it and they get income from somewhere else, then whether or not they are eligible for the COVID-19 disaster payment is another question outside the scope of this example. Thanks, Michael. Um, Bridget, when we say approved to be paid, which is communicated, um, can we give more detail on when payments will be made? So once it leaves service, it goes to the financial institution and we generally say that um, once approved, we'd like the payment to be made within five days. That's that's the goal. Thank you. OK, so our next question is around a business that has offices in multiple um, cities in Australia and it's around calculating the 30 percent down downturn in turnover for the support packages. Um, does the business just isolate the New South Wales turnover or is it the decrease calculated Australia wide? And I think you touched on this briefly before, yeah. Michael. But So that's a really good question and it is the Australia wide turnover um, of the ungrouped entity. 
So it is Australia wide, and that's simply because um, this is a joint New South Wales Commonwealth program. Um, and so it's aligned to a lot of the Commonwealth requirements, which is that it be a national decline. And, and while we're on the topic of national, um, some of the websites have dropped the, the word national um, from the aggregated turnover. Yeah. Can yeah. we provide a little bit of clarity around that, please? Yeah, so, so this is, and, and this is something that really has come out of the evolving situation. Um, when this was a small business um, type package, um, uh, when it was limited to firms below 50 million, this wasn't an issue. And then we've opened it up to much larger firms now. And so the issue of foreign revenue has come into question. Um, but the word national is essentially there to differentiate from state. Um, but but uh, the, the concept that we are linking to is the ATO uh, aggregated um, turnover concept. And that includes the turnover of uh, both national turnover, but also the turnover of foreign grouped affiliates. Thanks, Michael. Um, the, the next question is around um, multiple businesses operating under a single ABN. And if one of the businesses has a downturn of 30%, but the other two aren't impacted, does the client still meet the turnover requirements? And I think, David, maybe you could help with this one. It's a slightly tricky one, that one. Um, three three businesses under one single so it's ABN. One ABN. One and, ABN and three yep. businesses is very unusual. It's just that it. I'd have to look at the exact circumstances. It, um, it strictly speaking, I think we'd be looking at it as. Um, trying to work out the downturn of all, all businesses because it's a bit unusual the way it's the actual questions. Uh, so, so normally you have you normally have multiple ABNs for one business. Correct. Not the idea that you have multiple businesses for one AN, ABN is quite um, unusual. So it would come down to whether or not um, there were other entities in, in existence and whether or not those entities um, uh, were separately reporting GST revenue. But if they were not separately reporting GST revenue, then it would be treated as one business. Um, if they were um, separately reporting GST revenue, then um, then they would be able to degroup for the purposes of the turnover decline test. I'd probably suggest one ABN, one application mm. usually. I would say so, yeah. So yeah, generally I think one ABN is one business. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, I think we might have time for one last question before we need to start wrapping up. Um, how do we calculate the drop in revenue when a business is seasonal and, um, you know, that the amount of revenue might change depending on the time of the year? Great question. And that's why um, we've, we've set up the comparisons period, periods with the prior year. And it's why we've also required that um, it be that the decline in revenue be due to the impact of the restrictions. So, for example, if you're a farmer running a business and the time of year at which your crop has matured or um, has come on board or um, this year your crop didn't um, mature for, for reasons to do with the weather, um, then that um, revenue decline is not to do with COVID. That's to do with the weather. And, and that is not um, an application that you should make for a business grant. Um, so, so clearly there has to be a uh, narrative behind, um, behind those comparison periods. It can't just be a pure comparison test. It's got to be linked to uh, the restrictions. So, and we will look very closely at those types of applications where we know the businesses to have either intermittent or seasonal income. Um, and we know that you know, school holiday dates change, the dates at which crops mature change. Um, and so that, that comparison um, has to be a fair one. Thank you, Michael. Great answer. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I'll just ask one final question and then I'll give everyone in the panel an opportunity to touch on any key points that you think would be pertinent based on the type of questions we've been receiving. Last question is, what is the exact process um, uh, sorry, the question just changed on me. Apologies. I was going to ask, what's the basis of declining turnover? Is it cash or accrual? Great question. Um, 
So if you're reporting GST in cash terms, then um, it's cash. If you're reporting GST in accrual terms, it's uh, accrual. Um, and I know there's, there's, there's issues around the business saying, well, I can't demonstrate, uh, I'm a cash business, but I can't demonstrate decline because um, I'm still getting checks coming in. So the way your business works is um, because it's a cash business, not an accrual business, um, your business's revenue is not declining until the cash revenue stops coming in. Um, so uh, the main difference between cash and accrual, as we know, is timing. And so given the length of the lockdown, you will be eligible at some point. Um, and uh, because because obviously if the business has ceased to trade, then um, the income will, will decline. Uh, it's just that that may be a deferred decline um, to what it to, to, to what it might be for an accrual business. Um, and so you'll still be eligible to receive um, uh, uh, payments under the job saver package, but you might just have to wait until the revenues actually do decline before making that application. For an accrual business, that simply isn't the case because the, the payments are aligned, can be accounted for in line with when the activity is occurring. If activity ceases, then revenue ceases. Fantastic. Thank you for that answer, Michael. I'll now throw, uh, throw it open to the panel for anything that they'd like to reiterate or any additional points that you'd like to make before we uh, close for the evening. I think just, um, Philippe, that, you know, payments will happen quicker and things will get processed if the documentation is provided um, that's asked for in each of the um, grants here. Um, or as outlined by Michael, um, we have many in assessment where documentation hasn't been provided and that in effect causes a delay as well. So, um, you know, I think this has been a really helpful session, Michael, some great and updated information that we'll get out as well. But yeah, that would be my key message. Thanks, Bridget. Michael, anything from you? Any final remarks? Yeah, look, one thing that I, I probably should emphasise is, um, you know, these programs are at risk of fraud and, and what I'd ask of the accounting profession is to keep their eyes out for that because, um, you know, this is public money. It's designed to support businesses through um, this time. And if people are rorting the system, then that makes it harder for all of us. And it means we have to ask for more documents. And so I would, I would ask for their support from the accounting profession um, just to keep their eye out for that and please, um, please, please make sure that the businesses that you're seeing um, who, who make the application are doing it because they really need the funds because there are so many that do. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Some great relevant points there. Um, David, did you want to say anything? Uh, I was just going to quickly mention We've seen a lot of uh, people not put in the entry from their BAS appropriately a lot. So, and that causes us to need to make contact and need to get things re-approved. Uh, so uh, please remember to calculate a weekly component, not a monthly or a three monthly component in your application. That And that's just one tip. Thanks, David. That's a great tip. Um, and finally, John, I know you've been looking at a lot of inquiries that come through. Are there any prominent ones that you want to just say a couple of words about? Look, I think it, this has been a fantastic forum and it really has uh, covered a lot of those questions and, and cut the themes that, of the questions that we are getting through. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I, along with with a, an ever-growing team of business concierges and knowledge management uh, specialists, are here to help. And you know, we all come from a place that we want to help businesses in this difficult time, and that uh, we we are working seven days a week to to take those calls and to provide the answers and to support business. Thanks, David. I think that's a, uh, sorry, John, that's a beautiful way to end. And I'd like to thank you, um, Bridget, Michael and David for your time this evening to answer some of the questions that we received from the audience and also thank the audience for their time and for joining us. Um, we did get a lot of questions that we probably didn't get to this evening, but we will endeavour to update our website and our uh, online content to try and answer some of those common ones through our um, FAQs. And we will be updating the toolkit for accounting and tax professionals with the new developments and information from the session tonight, which will then be sent out soon. Thanks again for your time and um, we'll hopefully uh, get some applications out quickly to you. Thanks.
Thank you.